This week, the big theme for Impact was Hardcore Justice, something that was once a pay-per-view event that has now become a regular Impact with some hardcore gimmicks attached to it and is given barely a mention or two the week before. And unfortunately, that feels oddly fitting because, let's be honest, when you're doing street fights and no DQ matches and hardcore gimmicks on Impact almost every week anyway, what the hell is so special about Hardcore Justice? Not much. These matches don't feel special anymore because you do them so often. Now they just feel like business as usual. And when you add that to the fact that most of the country was going to be at the movie theaters on Friday for opening night of Avengers Age of Ultron and probably not staying at home to watch wrestling, I almost have to wonder why TNA even bothered with this. With me and, I'm guessing, a fair chunk of the audience becoming desensitized to all these gimmicks, not shockingly, my favorite parts of the show this week were the ones without gimmicks. After that hilarious EC3 2015 promo from last week that parodied the State of the Union address, here we have Ken Anderson doing a parody of the parody. Not quite as funny as last week, granted, but still clever and topical, and when you put EC3 in there, the crowd really started eating this up. I don't know if I'd have Anderson be the one to break EC3's win streak necessarily, but it does feel like the time is drawing closer with them starting to make a bigger deal out of the possibility of someone doing it, and they've done a good job building anticipation for that moment. Whether or not it happens next week, I couldn't say, but it's certainly the segment I'm most looking forward to. Shut up and follow me. I think TNA might just be onto something with the dollhouse. I admit, I'm not really digging their music or their entrance yet, personally, but the girls seem talented enough to sell it, and it does look like there's been some legit work put into branding this group, not as just another beautiful people retread, but as something new for the knockouts that people should get excited about. I like Taryn Terrell versus Brooke for the most part. The fans are getting behind Brooke nicely, and hopefully TNA won't drop the ball with her push this time. Taryn, I think, is still figuring out the best way to make her moveset work with a heel ring style, but she does look like she's having a lot of fun working as a heel, and her mannerisms felt spot on to me. But the best part, in my opinion, came after the match, when Gail Kim says that she doesn't want any of the knockouts to be in her shadow, and Taryn just completely cuts her off and says that it's time for Gail to be in her shadow. I love that, and it's something that's needed to happen for a long time. Regardless of how Gale feels, I think it's been pretty obvious over the years that, to a certain extent, TNA did want the other knockouts to be in her shadow. How many times have we seen Gale Kim get pushed or featured at the expense of some other knockout who would have benefited from that spot a lot more? I can't even count them. And there's always been the admittedly very good excuse that Gale probably could outperform all of them in the ring, and that's why this kept happening. But for a long time, it felt like TNA wanted Gale to be untouchable until the day she retired, which is really counterproductive if you want to create new female stars. And if they're really trying to do that now, they need to stick to their guns and allow other girls to be seen on the same level as Gale, whether they like it or not. And they did that here. Finally. Yes! Sorry, sorry, I just went to check my mail. Can you believe it? I still have not gotten my royalty check for the TKO idea. That thing is incredibly late at this point. I mean, what kind of clown shoes operation are they running down in Nashville? You know, I have half a mind to call TNA about this. I was really impressed with this Magnus James Storm segment. I mean, yeah, their promos were both great, but we expect that from these guys. What I thought was interesting was how muddied they made the face-heel dynamic here. It's obvious that Storm is the heel and he's up to something, and Magnus is the good guy just trying to look out for his family, but in the process, Magnus could almost be viewed as being the more heelish of the two. Because on the surface, James Storm doesn't seem to have done anything wrong. It's all implied. So far, the most suspicious thing he's done is convincing Mickey James to wrestle one more time, which is something the crowd really wanted. Whereas Magnus is the guy who's got a cameraman following his family around in order to spy on a man with whom their interactions seem pretty innocent. So Magnus is the face and Storm is the heel, but because Storm is playing this mental chess game so much better than Magnus is right now, the roles almost seem reversed. And that's pretty interesting. That's some clever writing right there. And again, it speaks to the underrated charisma of James Storm, because not everyone would be able to make something like that work. 
But then we have all the hardcore stuff, and for me, this is where the show gets much less interesting. Don't misunderstand, every match on this show was good or better, but they want us to think that there's something really special and unique about it just because of all these hardcore gimmicks, which they use all the time. It doesn't feel special and unique to me, it just feels like more of the same stuff, some of which was transparent and unnecessary. We start the show with a six-man street fight with Davey Richards and the Hardys versus The Revolution. It's a big, fun, chaotic match that continues the respective feuds between these guys, even though I'm not sure there's much mileage left in them. Everybody worked hard. I have no complaints about it, but did I think it was something special because it was a street fight? No. They have street fights that impact almost every week. Then there's a four-way ladder match for the X Division title that left me scratching my head at times. And not just because the ladder didn't seem to have a point to it other than just putting another gimmick on Hardcore Justice. It would have made more sense if it had just been Rockstar Spud and Kenny King. They had a reason to be fighting. But then you put Mark Andrews in there. I guess you could say that it's his official debut post-UK tour, so you want to start him off in a big match. Okay. But it's not a showcase for Andrews. He gets a few impressive spots, but ultimately the match really isn't about him. They didn't even show his entrance on TV for crying out loud. If you've got a role for him now, great. But it does seem strange that you wouldn't start him off in a match where he would be the main focus. And is it even worth asking how Tigre Uno earned a title shot when he hasn't won anything in like a year? How the hell did he get into this match? Again, no complaints about the match. It was a lot of fun. Though it was very disappointing to see Rockstar Spud lose the X Division title when they hadn't done jack shit with him as the champion. But what killed this for me more than anything was Spud's post-match promo. It's a very good promo. He's upset and emotional about losing the title that he worked 14 years for because being the X Division champion meant that he was on the same list as guys like AJ Styles, Jerry Lynn, etc. It meant that he was one of the best and that was special to him. We finally heard from Rockstar Spud what being the X Division champion really meant to him, and we didn't hear it until after he lost the fucking title. This is a promo that would help the audience develop an emotional investment in Spud having the X Division title. And it's the kind of thing we should have heard after he won it, not after he lost it. If he'd cut that promo a few weeks ago in the UK, him losing the belt here might have meant something. But his title reign went nowhere and they gave us no reason to care about it until after it ended. So, it didn't. I'm on a hell of a lot of fucking Jägermeister! So you've got Drew Galloway facing Low Key in a pipe on a pole match. Again, really good match. And again, the storytelling is what ultimately fucks it up. If weapons are legal here, and they spend the entire match waffling each other with a steel chair, then what the hell makes the pipe so damn important? Nothing! Absolutely nothing! I'm not even exaggerating about that. You've got a pipe on a pole match where not once does anyone ever get hit with the fucking pipe! So you've taken the weapon that this whole thing is supposed to hinge on and made it completely irrelevant to the outcome of the match! So why even do a pipe on a pole match in the first fucking place? This is unbelievable. This doesn't make any sense. The nice thing about the Angle EY stretcher match is that at least everything made sense here. I cringed every time they did a pile driver, and I really wish TNA would ban that move. But regardless, it's a good match with no bullshit, nothing that didn't make sense, and the heel wins clean. And if you absolutely have to do this feud, that's probably the best way to go if you want people like me to take Eric Young seriously as a threat to Kurt Angle. That being said, I still don't buy this. Eric always seems like he's fighting the urge to go more comedic, and that doesn't help when it's such an uphill battle for me to find him believable in this role. When he says he's going to end Angle's career, and he's staring into the camera with these comically enlarged, crazy eyes, I just sniggered. Because the idea of that was funny to me. And it's not supposed to be. They're trying really hard to make this Eric Young thing work, but for me, more character surgery is needed if that's even going to be a possibility. Maybe this is something that Billy Corgan can iron out. And I haven't talked about what Billy Corgan joining the company means yet, because... I really don't know what the hell it means. Supposedly, he'll be working in creative. He's been running his own indie company for a number of years, so we can assume that he has a good understanding of the creative aspects of the business. And I am encouraged that he's not a guy formerly of TNA or WWE, 
not just some close personal friend of someone in management, someone who might offer a different perspective and have different ideas TNA isn't used to, which is almost surely going to be beneficial. Everything is still going through the same filter ultimately, so I'm not expecting this to bring about any massive changes in the product, but I don't think having a fresh voice in the writer's room would be a bad thing right now, quite the opposite. Maybe Billy Corgan's got something to offer. Or maybe this is just a publicity stunt like Chris Melendez was and it'll be done in a few months. We really don't know. Time will tell on that. As for this week, however, this was a good wrestling show that was a little flawed creatively and had some gimmicks that were obviously shoehorned in without really meaning anything. Maybe Billy Corgan can cause some of those things to change, but for right now, it's pretty much the same old story. Over. Out.